together and I could see everybody's faces. <laughs> um, it's harder to, uh, to interact in this type of setting, but I'm hoping that we can, um, after the presentation, have a bit of a discussion and help to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I'll do my best to, to share my knowledge of native plants and uh, hope that it inspires you to incorporate native plants into your own backyard gardens if you haven't done so already. So I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen here. Okay, that's coming in okay, Kelly. Very good. Okay, so um, as Kelly mentioned, my name is Carrie Royer. I am the coordinator of community outreach and volunteers with the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. And our presentation is on gardening with native plants. The Niagara Peninsula watershed is situated within the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Attawandrak, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, the watershed is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Through the NPCA's 10-year strategic plan, we reconfirm our commitment to shared stewardship of natural resources and deep appreciation of Indigenous culture and history in our watershed. So just a little bit of an overview of the presentation this evening. So I'm gonna just um, introduce myself and my background, share a little bit of information about what is the NPCA for anyone who is not familiar with the organization. We're gonna talk about native plants and some terminology around native plants, um, how to go about buying them, some common invasives, uh, where to begin if you're, if you're thinking about incorporating this into your own gardens some general guidelines, um, some information about collective impact and common good. The 90% of the land in Niagara and our watershed is privately owned. So collectively, we can have a very big impact if everybody contributes. And some of the resources that are available and will be shared to, um, by Kelly after the presentation are available online that can be downloaded and used to get things started. And then we'll take some questions at the end. So a little bit about myself, I, um, I live in Welland. I've been born and raised in Niagara and I absolutely love um, including native plants in my own garden. I, this is all pictures from my own backyard. Um, I love seeing all the different types of uh, pollinators and insects that come and visit my garden every year and how certain things do really well in some areas and how certain things don't do well at all. Um, I have better luck with my native plants outside than I do with my indoor plants. I'm terrible at keeping indoor plants. Um, huge advocate for monarch butterflies and pollinators and just creating everybody's you know, own little sanctuary and habitat in their own backyard. I love to hike and kayak and spend time out in nature when I'm not working. Um, and these are just some photos I thought I would share this evening because it's very close to the topic that we're talking about. Spring ephemerals refer to um, plants that come up right early in the spring. Um, these photos were taken on Saturday, right beha before we had that dumping of, sorry, not on Saturday, I got my days mixed up. Um, on Monday, right before we had that dumping of snow, I had gone out for a hike with my family and um, came across all of these little green things poking up and just thought I would share some of these uh, native woodland plants. So this, the first photo here um, with the sort of frilly leaves is called Dutchman's Britches. Um, and it's named because when the flower comes out, you can kind of see it in the photo, but as it gets um, more white and a little bit bigger, the, the, um, the flower actually looks like a pair of white pants. Um, this is of course our native, uh, the trillium, just poking up. This, um, plant over here is called bloodroot and it has a pretty little white flower similar to like a little daisy and the reason it's called bloodroot is if you pick this plant um, and you break the root system you actually see that it bleeds out like a red like a dark dark red that looks like blood um, so that's where that one got its name and the last one the little white flowers in the last photo is called hepatica so these are all those sort of really early things that just start poking out um, out of the garden and then got covered in snow <laughs> shortly after I took these photos. Carrie, can I, um, you're in presenter mode, would you be able to make your 
present the slideshow a bit larger just so it can appear a bit bigger. Oh, sure. How do I do that? Um, there should be a... Um, I'm in presenter mode. Yeah, we can mm. see like your notes and... Oh, why not? So I just wanted to okay, so I'm sharing the wrong it. screen. Okay, let me just yeah. Uh, so, uh, sorry, one second, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> I just realized we were in a little bit of a tiny. Sorry uh, so about that. Make that a little bit larger if possible for everyone. Yeah, for sure. I'm very sorry. Let me just close that and do this. These are the joys. Okay, and then. This is why we miss in-person programs. <laughs> the technology talking. is always the fun part. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but we will be uh, uh, getting back into that slowly and doing some, uh, again, some fun fresh air programs with the NPCA coming up. Um, I think some fun hikes and whatnot, uh, which are always a good time with Carrie because we were in lots. <laughs> I, um, sorry. Thank you for telling me, Kelly, because I would have done the whole presentation like that. Um, Okay, so my apologies, everyone. Zoom meeting, share screen. Saying screen sharing has failed to start. Uh, so then if you- Are we good now? There we go, beautiful. Okay. Excellent, thank you, <laughs> Sorry Carrie. about that. Not um, a problem. <laughs> all right. So um, just a little bit about the conservation authorities. So there are a number of conservation authorities across uh, Southern Ontario. Um, so they were established through the Conservation Authorities Act in 1946. And this is largely due to um, Hurricane Hazel, which some of you may be aware of that caused pretty significant flooding damage and really highlighted the need to do some some planning uh, with respect to where we're building and things like that and also due to the loss of soil and erosion and things like that and it was really a grassroots movement to get conservation authorities established so that we had that you know very close um, at the landscape level um, management of natural resources and that we were all sort of working together to try to preserve some of these um, these important natural features um, so we are watershed based is not based on political boundaries. So all of the conservation authorities you can see are based on um, the lines of those individual watersheds and a watershed is just an area of land where when the water, uh, when it, the water lands on um, that area, it drains to one creek or river or stream. So that is how our jurisdiction is based and that's how it is for all conservation authorities in Ontario. So the the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority was established in 1959. We have approximately 60 full-time employees and that number goes up slightly in the summertime when we hire a number of seasonal students to help with some of our, our programs and the maintenance of some of our conservation areas. And we're responsible for watershed-based natural resource management. Our jurisdiction is um, close to 250,000 hectares and we cover all of the Niagara region as well as parts of the city of Hamilton and Haldeman County. So this is a map of our, our jurisdiction. So you can see the little blip um, of Hamilton and Haldeman that's included in our jurisdiction. And then all the blue dots are conservation areas that are found across the watershed. Many of which have lovely hiking trails. Um, so we manage 41 conservation areas and they are um, held in public trust for recreation, heritage preservation, conservation and education. So some of our conservation areas are actively promoted as destinations for hiking and recreation, while others are meant more for just nature preservation and birding and that kind of thing. Um, we do flood and natural hazard management, source water protection, ecosystem restoration, water quality monitoring and quantity monitoring. So flood forecasting and flood um, alerting the public of potential flooding is um, a part of what we do. And then we also have an active community engagement and volunteer program, which is why I'm here speaking with you this evening. So let's get into the topic of native plants. Um, so native plants are naturally occurring from the area and they were here prior to European settlement, they evolved here. So they weren't brought over, they weren't um, you know, planted here. 
uh, they were already here naturally. So some differences in terminology, because depending on who you're speaking to, they may have different um, ways of describing plants. So native are those naturally occurring um, plants and then exotic or alien are non-native um, species that are introduced to a location outside of its natural area. And this is where many of our horticultural plants fall in this exotic or alien um, category. So you'll often hear things like Rus Russian sage or Japanese maple. Um, that's kind of a tell for the fact that they probably are not naturally occurring here. An invasive plant is a hardy or tolerant plant that can overtake and displace native species. So not all exotic or alien species become invasive. Invasive is a term that's used for those plants that tend to take over and displace native plants. And then a weed um, is any plant native or exotic or invasive that is not wanted by humans. So different folks have different terminology um, or different you know, plants that they call a weed. Uh, one example that I use often is um, goldenrod. Some people would not tolerate goldenrod in their plants um, in their garden and would consider it to be a weed because it spreads easily and it's, you know, grows wild everywhere. So it's considered a weed by many, but for um, local wildlife and local insects, uh, goldenrod is a very, very important local native plant. So native plants tend to be resistant to drought, disease, and nutrient poor soil. So anybody that lives in Niagara and likes to garden knows that you are often dealing with clay soils, which can be challenging. And so our native plants are best suited and adapted to those, those clay soils. If you're lucky enough to live in an area like Pelham or some parts of Welland where you have nice sandy loam, uh, then you <laughs> have fewer challenges. Um, but for the most part, Niagara is, is covered in clay or you're dealing with shallow bedrock because you're close to the escarpment. Um, erosion control and filtration are really important qualities that native plants can, can help with because they have such a deep root system. They're typically long living perennials that will come back year after year. So once you buy one, you can you know, enjoy it coming back up year after year. You don't have to buy new ones every year like you do with annuals. And typically this is a plant that will grow and spread and you can even split it off and share it or trade it with um, friends and neighbors that also like to garden. They have an abundant seed source, which is again, important food for local wildlife. And they often have wildlife that is associated with those specific plants. Um, adding native plants to your garden can increase your plant diversity and thereby increase the diver diversity of um, wildlife that visits your garden and your yard. And the other benefits are things like, um, you know, less water usage for watering. My, <laughs> my native plants are typically the only things that aren't looking droopy and sad if we have a, a period of drought in the summertime. They usually are doing just fine. Some considerations when it comes to native plants is that it's sometimes hard to find truly native plants. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, sometimes property standard bylaws can conflict with people's desires to have certain native plants in their yard. So it's always best to look into your local municipalities, property standard bylaws. Milkweed is a common example that is considered to be a noxious weed by many municipalities and it still exists on property standard bylaws that you cannot have noxious weeds growing in your yard. So that's you know a good example of where somebody may want to plant milkweed because they want to help butterfly milkweed, but they're, um, sorry, because they want to help monarch butterflies, um, but they are not allowed to based on the property standard bylaws of the municipality that they live in. So always just best to check. And the other property standard bylaw that could be um, impacting your native garden is sometimes there are rules around the height of plants and um, things that you can grow in your yard. So that's another thing to look for. Uh, native plant gardens must be maintained in order to avoid the sort of messy look. Um, they can be very neat and tidy, but it does take some work just like any garden. Um, if, you live, if you just leave them to sort of grow without any care or maintenance, um, they will tend to get tall and fall over and then just sort of look messy and might be something that, um, again, gets um, an issue with a property standards bylaw or with your neighbor or uh, whatever the case may be. And native plants are easily confused with native cultivars. And again, 
Uh, we'll get into that a, a little bit more as we get into the further slides. Um, two of the native plants that are in this slide, um, the top right hand side is wild ginger, which is another woodland plant that comes up early in the spring. It has a really pretty little maroon color flower that you really have to kind of poke under the leaf in order to see it. Otherwise, it just looks like a big green heart shaped leaf. And the liatris or the blazing star is the purple flower in the in the photo with the butterfly. So this is a sh diagram just showing the extensive root system of native plants. So um, this number, sorry, not number, this letter A plant over here is your typical lawn grass. So you can see the very shallow root system and this is why lawns tend to dry out if they aren't watered properly um, when we have a drought. And this is why they go brown and are not great um, when people mow right up to the edge of say a creek or a stream on their property, um, they'll start to see that the bank is gonna start to slowly erode away because these, um, these plants really just don't have much of a root system at all. Where when you look at something like a goldenrod, which is this one here, letter N, has a very extensive and intricate network of roots underground and very, very deep root system. So that allows that plant to tap into the water that's kept deep underground so that when the first few inches of soil dries out in the summertime, those roots are doing just fine because they are tapping into the lower, the lower water sources. So just this is just to show you the, the difference with the root system of, of some of these plants. So native plants, uh, native forage plants, native food plants will um, attract local wildlife. And I always say that it's best to get your inspiration from nature. So walking around a, a natural area close to your home and see what's growing well there is a great way to get started and to know what will do well in your own backyard. Um, diversity of colors, flower shapes, bloom times, all those things are really important. Um, so these plants are all native wildflowers that have um, different benefits to different species. So this purple flower at the top is a pale purple cone flower, which is a more unique or less common version of an echinacea plant. This middle red plant is a bee balm. This is goldenrod, of course, which is that beautiful yellow forage. Um, pickerel weed is a wetland plant. So this is one that's great if you're doing a backyard water garden to include pickerel weed. This is a butterfly milkweed. So it's a little um, shorter than your common milkweed and it has a bright orange color. This is a sweet oxide daisy, the yellow, yellow flower in the middle. Again, the liatris, the purple, the blazing star. And then this white flower is called Virginia Mountain Mint. And a lot of people ask me when I um, go on and on about the benefits of Virginia Mountain Mint, if it's invasive, like some of the, um, the herb mint, and it is not. Um, the native plant grows tall and it is not one that you're going to, you know, people jokingly say that once you have it on your property, you're gonna take it with you to the next property. It'll just follow you along. This native Virginia mountain mint is not that way. And this plant um, blooms through most of the summer. And I can say that every time I come out and look at it in my garden, there's probably 10 or 15 different types of bees and hornets and um, different insects that are pollinating it and using this plant. It's always just covered in insects that are using it. It's, it's well loved, that's for sure. So obviously those, these native um, flowers are gonna attract the native wildlife that most people are trying to attract to their backyard. So cardinal flower is a great example of a native flower that has a beautiful red color that can attract hummingbirds. It's great for planting along backyard ponds and along streams. It really likes to have um, a little bit of a wetter root system. So that's an excellent choice if you're trying to attract hummingbirds. Of course, this is the common milkweed. And then this is the swamp milkweed. And then the purple flower over here is called New England Aster, which along with the goldenrod is a really important late fall blooming plant that allows pollinators to get that last sort of bit of food before um, everybody tucks in for the winter. And this is a brown-eyed Susan, which I think a lot of people would recognize as well. 
Asters and goldenrod. So this is, uh, I've been kind of talking a little bit about goldenrod and the benefits of it. And this is a little, a little blip um, from a book I read earlier this year called Braiding Sweetgrass. And if you haven't read it already, it's an excellent read. Um, the author is Robin Wall Kimmerer, and she talks about asters and goldenrod and why they look so beautiful when they grow next to each other in the wild. And if you've walked around anywhere in Niagara in the fall, you'll see that the purple and yellow colors are often dotted a lot across the landscape. And um, in the book, Robin talks about when she started her, her master's program in botany, she had her first meeting with a teacher and she, the teacher asked her why, or her professor asked her why she was interested in taking this botany course. And she said, because I wanna know why asters and goldenrod look so beautiful growing next to each other and he said, well, you're in the wrong class. You should be in an art class, not a botany class. Um, but as it turns out, um, the more she looked into it and the, you know, she wasn't dismayed, she ended up taking the class anyways, but she came to find out that because purple and yellow on a color wheel are two very opposite colors. And so they're the most opposite that you can be in terms of color. So what makes them attractive to a human is also what makes them attractive to a bee or other pollinator. And so goldenrod and aster, when they grow next to each other are pollinated far more often than when they're growing alone. And so there is actually a scientific reason as to why they grow together and, and why they look beautiful is because the same reason we think they're beautiful is the same reason that bees are attracted to them and that's how they get, they get pollinated. So um, I think of that often whenever I'm um, driving around in the fall and see these these plants and goldenrod is one of those plants that comes in, you know, 10 or 15 different shapes and sizes. There's some that are flat topped and some that are more like an umble shape and some that are um, just, they come in such a variety of shapes and sizes. They do grow tall, but again, these two plants in particular, very, very, very important fall forage for lots of different insects and birds. So tips for buying native plants. This is one of the most important things that I can share with you when it comes to incorporating native plants into your garden. A lot of people have really good intentions and head out to their local garden center with a list of native plants and come back with native cultivars. And a native cultivar is a horticultural version that has been modified and genetically uh, selected for certain character traits and has been grown in greenhouses. And the seed source is often not local because a plant like an echinacea or a rutabecchia is a plant that grows in lots of different places. And when you're looking for native plants, you really want the seed source to be as close to this um, local area as possible. So in Niagara, you're looking for plants that are in seed zone 37 and that have been locally collected or sourced in seed zone 37. That's the most important thing. Um, one of the easy clues to spot a cultivar from a local native plant is that the cultivars often have a sort of cutesy name associated with their common and scientific name. So this plant tag that says Echinacea coneflower, and then it has the kismet yellow slash tanicky. I don't even know if that's the right way of pronouncing it. That's sort of the cutesy name that goes along with it. And for anybody that knows Echinacea, you know that in nature, they're purple, they're not yellow. So this has been modified and genetically selected to create this yellow, which is really cool if you're trying to, um, you know, have a, a big diversity of it, you know, I'm not saying don't ever go out and buy cultivars. I realize that that is something that, you know, everybody's going to have some cultivars in their garden, but when you're going out specifically looking for native plants that they often are grown by smaller companies, not big, um, big companies like some of the cultivars. And so they'll often have handwritten tags um, and they won't have these fancy pictures and these, you know, these little cutesy names as associated with them. They'll have, you know, the scientific name or the common name. So one of the things that Carolinian Canada has done recently is to try to make it easier for people to spot those truly local source native plants. And so Carolinian Canada has created these tags that they've given to a number of local native plant suppliers that are growing plants in southern Ontario 
and it's these in the zone. So this tag is, it's pretty and it's colorful, it's easy to recognize, and that will establish that that plant is locally sourced and has been vetted by an organization like Carolini in Canada to, to say, yes, that is a native plant. Um, the NPCA does have a list of native plant suppliers that are local to this area on our website. And I think it's one of the resources that Kelly will share with everyone. And those are ones that we have already vetted and we know that they are suppliers of, of native plants. Um, the nice thing with the partnership that Carolinian Canada has done with some of these growers is that a lot of these plants are now available at local Loblaws stores. So they're more um, available to the general public because they can pick them up as they're going to do groceries or whatever. They're, they're just a little bit more available, a little bit more visible um, because often garden centers don't carry native plants unless they specialize in growing native plants. Some common invasives that are found in gardens and in garden centers are Japanese knotweed, uh, Phragmites or common reed, which is this sort of feathery tall plant that you see along the roadsides and in ditches. Periwinkle or vinca, which um, I know my, my parents had a ton of vinca around our, our pond when I was growing up. It was one of my dad's favorite plants. Uh, once you have vinca, it's another one of those ones that you, can, you can't really get rid of it too easily. Um, it has a very, very thick root system that's, that's hard to get out. Lily of the valley, um, goutweed, English ivy, daylilies or tiger lilies. Uh, Norway maple or crimson king is another one that you see often. Um, it's, it's called crimson king because it is a, it's a maple tree that has dark purple or dark red leaves all throughout the year. That is a, a cultivar of a Norway maple, which is highly invasive. And when it escapes and seeds out into a natural area or a forest, it creates a very, very dense shade that does not allow those little blood roots and the gingers and the Dutchman's britches and those kinds of native woodland plants to grow underneath. A normal um, native sugar maple has more of a dappled shade. And so things are allowed to grow underneath it. Whereas the Norway maple, people that have them sometimes can't even get their grass to grow underneath them. It just creates such a dense, dense shade along with the, the density of the canopy and the color of the leaves. It's just really, really dark underneath them. So great for creating shade if you're trying to create shade in your backyard, uh, but not so great when it escapes into natural areas. Um, Japanese barberry is another common um, horticultural plant that you can buy at a garden center that does escape and become problematic in uh, natural areas. And honeysuckles, there are a ton of different types of honeysuckles, and there are a few that are native, but not any of the ones on my list here are native. And then yellow flag iris is a wetland plant that is commonly found in backyard gardens and ponds and things like that. It has a bright yellow flower, it's a beautiful flower. Um, but it is aggressive and it outcompetes the, the native um, blue flag iris, which is the, the local plant, the native plant. The Ontario Invasive Plant Council has come up with an excellent resource to help people make selections about um, what plants to put in their backyard gardens. It's called Grow Me Instead. It's another downloadable resource. There are hard copies available as well. Sometimes if you just send them an email, they can, they can mail you one. And it is basically a guide that shows you common invasive plants and a native alternative to those plants. So instead of planting vinca or periwinkle, you can plant bunchberry or wild strawberry instead. Or instead of planting English ivy, you can plant uh, running strawberry vine. So there are just lots of different options for trees and shrubs and wildflowers that you can use as alternates to, um, to invasive plants. Questions, <clears throat> excuse me, questions to ask yourself are things like, where are you going to use native plants? Um, who do you want to attract? Why do you want to attract those species? What do you want to provide for them? And are you planning to do something more formal or more natural? So when it comes to the where, some considerations are things like low wet spots retiring areas that are no longer used in your yard, um, creating connectivity like fence lines and things like that, that will create connectivity be between say a natural area nearby and your yard, enhancing existing areas, just making them a little bit bigger, 
or, um, you know, stretching them out. Um, and then your short-term and long-term goals. The thing that I think is overwhelming sometimes is I know <laughs> I've done a few of these presentations and then, um, you know, folks think, oh my God, I need to convert all of my gardens to native plants. And that's not the expectation and you can't get everything done all at once. So my suggestion is always to start small, start by incorporating a few native plants here and there, see what is doing well, what is successful, what is growing well in your yard, and then you can start splitting it out and making your garden bigger or adding it to other gardens in your yard. Um, so what are your short-term goals and what are your long-term goals for your property is one thing to think about when you're planning. When it comes to the who, who are you trying to attract? Um, so insects like pollinators, spiders, and pest eaters, um, seed eaters, so birds um, and other types of animals that eat seeds, insect eaters, ground dwellers, voles, snakes, and toads, water lovers, so things like dragonflies and frogs, and then specialists versus generalists. So what I mean by that is some species are specialists and will only forage or eat one specific plant. Um, there's a type of bee that is only attracted to Monarda or Bergamot flowers and they will only forage on those plants. If you're trying to attract those bees, then you obviously need to plant the bee bomb. Um, if you're trying to attract more generalist species that will sort of forage on anything, then you can have a greater um, diversity of things that you're able to plant in order to attract that species. Um, obviously a good example of a, a specialist is a, a monarch butterfly, which will only lay their eggs and the larvae will only eat milkweed plants. So if you want to attract monarch butterflies, you're going to need to plant the, uh, the milkweed. Once it's a grown adult butterfly, it will forage on any flower. Um, but as when it comes to laying their eggs, they will only lay on milkweed plants. Um, insect eaters is a really important one, and there's a really great um, webinar I watched a couple of years ago now by Doug Talami, and he says that one of the most important plants that people can add to their yard is, a, is an oak tree, and an oak tree is very commonly used for caterpillars and other type of insects to lay their eggs, and that in turn becomes a very important food source for local birds. Insectivores are the type of birds that are the most declining types of birds um, in this area. So things like bluebirds um, that rely on those, those insects to eat. They won't come and eat at your bird feeder unless you're putting out mealworms or something like that. They won't come and eat seed. They only eat insects. And the, those insectivores or insect eating birds are the most declining species that you'll find here in Niagara. So the best way to attract those types of birds is to plant the plants that are going to attract the insects that they're going to eat. So it's about a little bit about thinking about life cycles and things like that. Um, what is a pollinator? So basically a pollinator is just any insect or bird um, that is going to transfer pollen from the male part of a flower to the female part of a flower. So that can be anything from um, bats, bees, butterflies, moths, um, various types of insects as they're moving from plant to plant they're doing this without even you know knowing that they're doing it they're not doing it on purpose it's just because of how they they eat and forage why are you doing the project so a lot of different people have different reasons for incorporating native plants into their backyard sometimes it's for erosion control if they're living next to a stream or a river where they're slowly losing their bank and their property down the down the stream every year Erosion control is really important. So planting a buffer along the stream is the best way you can do that. Sometimes it's to lower your water bill. Um, there was a woman <laughs> that lived in Niagara on the Lake that called me 10 years ago. She said, Carrie, I just got my water bill and I am ready to go, <laughs> go to native plants because I spent all summer watering. And she had this astronomical water bill from trying to keep her annuals alive. And so she converted a huge section of her property to native plants because, you know, she just couldn't keep up with the watering and the cost of the water bill. Um, if you're doing it to improve habitat or biodiversity, then those are different goals. If you're trying to mitigate climate change, if you're trying to lower your maintenance um, time and your maintenance costs, if you're creating the buffers, 
um, between, you know, you and another property or those connectivity areas, the corridors. If you're trying to attract specific species, if you're trying to beautify your backyard, if you're trying to restore or give back to nature, or if you just think it's the right thing to do, these are all the different, you know, this is a list, it's not all the reasons, but it's, you know, some of the reasons that people choose to do these types of naturalization projects. Um, the tree in this photo is called a shagbark hickory. It's a Carolinian native tree uh, of the hickory family. So it has a, an edible fruit, which is nice for, for people and for squirrels. It also is great at attracting caterpillars and other insects that are eaten by those insectivore birds. And one of the nice features about the shagbark hickory and how it gets its name is the way the bark peels up on the tree like that. And this tree is actually important habitat for local wildlife like flying squirrels and bats and flying squirrels and bats will actually tuck up underneath that shaggy bark um, and get refuge from uh, from the elements at different times of the year or at in the you know when they're sleeping um, they're both nocturnal animals that kind of tuck up in these things during the day how do you want to track these things so first you got to know who you're wanting to attract and how you want to attract them so are you doing a formal garden do you want it to be neat and tidy are you okay with it being more of a naturalization project are you going to attract them with potted plants some people don't have a backyard and they just live in a condo and they have a patio or a porch they just want to put a few native plants in a potted plant that's great that's great too it's something uh, water gardens are another great way of incorporating native plants, um, whether you're going to be adding trees and shrubs to your yard and wildflowers and grasses. Um, one common thing to do is to add uh, shrubs that, that have berries to attract birds. Again, those are really important food sources. Um, thinking about, you know, providing those food sources beyond backyard bird seed and providing those sort of more natural um, foods for the local wildlife. So what do you want to provide? Do you want to provide food? Do you want to provide habitat? Do you want to provide water? And some considerations, I think I mentioned this earlier, but it's never a bad idea to repeat things. Um, diversity when it comes to color, bloom time, the shape of the flower. Some insects prefer flowers that have, you know, sort of a cuppy shape and some prefer that more open faced flower like a, a daisy or a, a brown eyed Susan. Those generalist versus specialist species, a diversity of trees, shrubs, wildflowers, and grasses is great as well if you have the space to do so. Different ecosystem types in your backyard. So having a little water garden is great. Having a little pollinator garden is great. Having some shade trees or some fruit bearing shrubs. Keeping a garden journal is a great idea because that really helps you kind of keep track of what things are working and what things are not working in your yard and start small. Like I said before, start with a few plants and see how it goes and start to see the benefits and then you'll want to keep adding them. This photo um, in the top right is purple flowering raspberry, which is a local native plant that likes to be a little bit in the shade and a little bit in um, moist soils. So some of those needs for pollinators are things like the forage. Um, some common native species of plants that are good for generalists are coneflowers, black-eyed Susans, asters, and milkweeds. In the fall and the winter, when it comes to your native plant garden, leave the mess. I know a lot of people like to kind of get going on their spring, spring cleaning and get things cleaned up in the fall raking leaves out of the garden and cutting back all the stems, but all those little nooks and crannies in the garden, especially this, the hollow stems of plants that are dying, as well as the leaf litter on the ground, are really important places for local wildlife to hide out for the winter. So things like salamanders and frogs and toads, as well as tiny little insects will go into those little spaces. Um, it's common to see those sort of bee hotels or bee um, habitats nowadays and a native uh, native flower garden is an excellent natural version of that all those hollow stems are the perfect little holes for all those little bees and critters to get into so don't get too um, clean or or too much pruning and that kind of thing done in the fall leave it leave it messy the messier the better that's where things are going to go hide in the winter 
And then don't clean them out too early in the spring, as we saw this weekend. When you think spring has arrived, sometimes you get that late snow. So it's better to just kind of leave things a little bit messy until we're sure that all the snow is gone and everything is, is, um, is going to warm up a little bit. Make plans for the future expansion of your garden in the fall and winter and start to make notes of what worked and where things were planted. Because as we all know, whatever was growing in the summertime, when you look at it in the spring, you're looking at a bare piece of soil going, I know there was something growing there, but I can't remember what it was or what it's called. Um, so just kind of making notes about where things are so that if you go to, you know, fill in that bare spot and then figure out that there was something growing there last year, you're not uh, doing it twice. The last um, thing I wanted to touch on with respect to this is pest control. Um, it's one of those things where if, if you build it, they will come. So um, don't expect to not have chew marks and things like that on your plants. Um, this is a native uh, redbud tree, the heart-shaped uh, green leaf on the left there. Um, and if we were all in a room together, I would ask if anybody knew what kind of um, insected that, that chewing on that, uh, on that plant. But I will tell you that it is a leaf cutter bee. So a leaf cutter bee comes in and makes these sort of crescent shaped perfect little circles on the leaf. They roll up the little leaf that they cut off um, like a little green cigar. And then they stick it in a little hole like in those bee hotels or in a stem. And that's where they lay their eggs and stuff it full of food. And that's how they feed um, their larvae. So when you see this on your plant, it's not going to kill your plant. It's not going to harm your plant. It's just the bees doing what they're supposed to be doing and using the plants the way they're meant to be used. Um, this uh, middle picture is a little bit more, looks a little more devastating. And when I first came across this, I was out for a hike and saw this tree and I was, I couldn't believe the size of the holes in this tree and, and was sort of curious what had done this. And it turns out that it was uh, made by a pileated woodpecker, which is a huge woodpecker and you don't see them very often, but you hear them or you see this sort of damage. And so, um, you know, something that you're going, oh my God, my poor tree, but it's being used by a really cool, cool bird. So just, you know, be aware of that. And then the last thing I have is the picture of the, um, the monarch butterfly caterpillars. And once you have them, they will munch on your, on the leaves of your milkweed and, and leave their, their frass or their poop everywhere, but don't be alarmed. It's not going to kill your plant. It, uh, it's just doing what they do. We all need to play a role. As I mentioned early on, 90% of the land is privately owned here in this watershed. So if everybody were to create a little bit of a natural oasis in their backyard or on their patio or in a pot, then at least we would have a bigger collective impact on helping nature a little bit. Um, you know, we, we've done a lot of um, destruction and um, a lot of natural areas in, the, in this part of the world are, are disappearing. So if everybody can play a role in helping nature and helping those wildlife species that need, need for us to, uh, to help them along, because nowadays the natural areas aren't just what they used to be. And so having that generational thinking and thinking of, you know, who, what are we doing to help these species um, is really important. Healthy landscapes benefit everyone. And I just wanted to touch a little bit on the Carolinian zone and what that means. So the Carolinian zone is this, this part of Southern Ontario and 25% of Canada's population lives in the Carolinian zone on 0.25% of the land mass of Canada. So that's a pretty significant statistic when you think about it and the density of people that, that live down here. And so um, with that density of people comes um, that we have more endangered and rare species than any other life zone in Canada. 73% um, of the landscape is highly productive agriculture, 98% is privately owned, and this is an area where there's huge diversity of ecosystems and, and species because it's the most temperate from a climate perspective area of Canada. Uh, we tend to have, you know, lots of different types of wildlife and, and plants that want to live down here as well. How can you improve habitat on your property? So removing invasive species, planting appropriate native species, reducing or eliminating chemical pesticides and fertilizers, reducing the amount of mown grass, 
and a small backyard pond or water garden is always a great little addition. And you'd be surprised um, how one small little water garden will attract frogs and dragonflies and damselflies and things like that. Birds will come and use it as a bird bath. Some examples of backyard projects are pollinator gardens and rain gardens, which is where um, you can put a little garden where your eaves trough runs down and it's a low wet area. You can plant native plants that like to have wet feet in those areas and help to soak up some of that extra excess water. And no project is too small. I mentioned earlier about porch plants. So the photo on the right with the monarch butterfly caterpillar hanging in the J, which is about to make a chrysalis was sent by a lady that lives in St. Catharines who um, it lives in a condo and has a potted swamp milkweed plant on her back patio. And this monarch butterfly laid its eggs on her plant and she had successful adults hatch from, from the plant on, in the pot on her porch. <laughs> so it didn't have to be part of a huge garden, especially in urban areas, any little oasis that we can provide is, is great. These are some of the resources that I think I mentioned Kelly is gonna share. Um, some butterfly host plants, woodland plant guides, butterfly garden seed packs, um, pollinator habitat guide, and one important resource that we have that's also available if anybody ever wanted a hard copy of it, I'd be happy to mail you one, is our native plant guide. So it's a guide for native plants that grow well in Niagara and the different habitat types. It's all separated by if you have like a sunny dry area, these are the plants that are appropriate. If you have a shady, moist area, these are the plants that are appropriate, just to help people make those choices about what will work well. I think I talked a lot longer than I expected to, so hopefully uh, I haven't put anybody to sleep, but happy to take any questions um, that anybody has with respect to uh, the native plants and the, and the gardening. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Carrie, for that. Um, lots of great information. And uh, I really like I emphasize, you know, uh, small or big, whatever you can do to help our native species and our area. Um, we're pretty fortunate to live in a beautiful area like Niagara. So protecting it as much as we can. Um, and again, those small steps add up to big changes sometimes. Uh, so we do have a question from Joe. Um, so just wondering, um, Coming from the generation where trilliums, like, you know, you don't touch trilliums, um, you know, but their woodlot is covered in trilliums. Um, yep. And uh, he's wondering if he should move these to gardens closer to his house and what are the considerations for those, like shade, wet feet, like what to make the best growing conditions for a plant like a trillium would be? Um, best growing conditions for a trillium, I would say, is a moist, shaded forest. Um, they tend to do really well in escarpment properties and, um, that's typically what they, you know, what they look for in terms of growing. You can buy trilliums at um, local garden centers. I've seen them. I've seen red trilliums and white trilliums, um, likely not the native ones. Um, and so, sorry, the other part of his question is whether he should move them. Yeah. And like what the best growing conditions, I guess, would be. Um, I know you're not supposed to, I believe you're not supposed to move trilliums still though. I'm not sure what the legislation on that is. Yeah. I, it's one of those things that I think um, is just generally speaking, you're not supposed to remove uh, native plants from any like conservation. I know like the NPCA has a rule about not removing native plants um, or any plants from our conservation areas. I think short hills would probably be the same. So any sort of conservation area, you're really not supposed to remove any plant material, not just trilliums. Um, but if you have them growing on your property and they're it's your own property, I don't think that there's a rule against against moving them on your own property. Um, so I, yeah, I would just say just try moving maybe a few just to kind of see if they do well, and then you can move more. I guess if they if they do well and they live um, after you've moved them, I, I'm not sure how well they transplant. That's one thing I'm not actually I've never tried transplanting them before, so I'm not sure um, how successful some plants are. Just not great to be transplanted they just don't like being moved but it's worth a try and try plant like try moving one or two and see how it goes would be awesome. my suggestion thank you for that and uh, Lorraine is wondering what's like the indication of the weather for when to start that spring garden cleanup I guess when is the best time to not be disturbing our little friends who are hiding in all the leaves yeah I would say it's kind of that general rule of like when the last frost has passed so again that long weekend in May seems to be that time where we know that the last frost is done. I would say you could start a little bit earlier than that if you're just sort of cleaning things out, but a lot of stuff will stay sort of 
dormant until you know they might come out for a few days I, I know I saw like a honeybee out a few weeks ago when we had a sunny day um, but they will typically kind of go back into their wherever they've been been hiding until the weather kind of gets more agreeable so I would say that May long weekend when you know the frost is gone is probably your best bet I know it's hard some days when you get a beautiful day and it's 17 outside and <laughs> we had one a few weeks ago you're tempted to get out there and clean the garden but then when you get the snow that we've had this week you understand why those those rules exist <laughs> absolutely or guidelines um, I should say not rules <laughs> always guidelines um, and Ashley is wondering if we have any resources um, or contacts for garden design. So are there any places you'd point someone interested in, I guess, the aesthetic look um, or the best practices other than that native plant guide you'd mentioned, which is available at the library? Yeah, like if somebody's interested in more of a like a landscaped a designed native plant garden or incorporating native plants in more of a designed way, I would reach out to some of the local um the local plant suppliers some of them do offer that kind of service I know I've worked with um, Sassafras Farms which is down in um, closer to Welland here before on more of a landscapey type garden they were helping us do pollinator gardens at the Penn Center in the little medians in the parking lot um, one year they decided that they were going to stop buying annuals for those and they were going to convert them to native plants and so they they worked with sassafras to kind of design it as a little bit more of a nice garden as opposed to like a natural sort of wild meadow area so i would reach out to some of those suppliers and see if that's the type of service that they can provide excellent and abigail um has a lot of wet muddy yard with a lot of sitting water she's wondering if there's any plant species you could recommend that would be good to help soak up this water um yeah any of those kind of rain garden plants um so like echinacea tends to be a plant that will do well in most areas marsh marigold are great for wet areas um cardinal flower uh joe pieweed bone set those are all plants that like those sort of wet root systems and will do well in those low wet areas and help to kind of absorb some of that wa excess water awesome. i know the feeling <laughs> I have lots of pockets like that in my yard too. For sure. Um, and Soraya uh, has a great question actually about vegetable gardens and native plants. Um, mm. Do native plants attract insects or rodents that are going to harm a vegetable garden? So like what's, I guess, the best symbiosis for those uh, different different fields of garden? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I think the native pollinator plants would attract a lot of insects that I think would be beneficial to a vegetable garden because they'll eat some of those pests. Um, you're going to have things that will uh, come in and eat. And then there are some pollinators that actually are special or yeah, specialists to certain garden plants. Like there's like a type of bee that will only forage on squash flowers, for example. So those are, um, they can work together um, to attract local wildlife. And I, I, like I said, I think having your pollinator garden adjacent to or close to your vegetable garden will help to kind of control the pests in your vegetable garden from from what I understand and I know. Does that help answer your question? Was that everything? I can't remember. I, what I the think so. Yeah, I just wonder how they get, if they're really, you know, benefits or whatnot. It sounds more beneficial than, than uh, detrimental to those. I would think so. Yeah, I, I can't see there being, um, I'm trying to think if there's any kind of pollinator that you might attract that might eat something in your vegetable garden. You're most likely to have yeah, like rabbits and things eating stuff in your vegetable garden. So um, I can't think of anything right now. It doesn't mean that that's, that's not a thing, but I think for the most part, you'd be more on the beneficial side than anything. For sure. Um, and so Karen is wondering about um, milkweeds. So she was told, I guess, that common milkweed spreads quickly and to avoid it. So I guess what, what are your thoughts on common milkweed or is there specific sort of varieties to focus in on or are some of those myths or what's your take on that? common milkweed does spread quite easily like it's one of those plants that can be hard to transplant but once you have it it will spread in your garden um, and I know that it does some people don't love it for that reason that it will you know it it sends out shoots underground um, so it will spread by seed but will also um, spread by sending shoots underground so if you have like a garden with um, common milkweed in it you might see little milkweeds poking up in your mown grass areas um, but for the most part, it's fairly easy to control. I don't think it's something that gets out of hand, but some of the other milkweed species like butterfly milkweed and swamp milkweed would be a little bit less 
prolific, I would say, compared to the common milkweed and just as good at attracting those, um, the butterflies and the other insects that you're looking to attract. Excellent. And uh, Jacqueline has a question about hummingbirds, um, when they're expected to arrive with it being a later spring. Mm. If you have any I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> I was just in Costa Rica, so I saw lots of hummingbirds, but it's tropical. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I definitely haven't seen any hummingbirds yet. I've seen lots of red-winged blackbird birds, and um, somebody was saying that they've just seen bluebirds recently. I would think that hummingbirds are a little bit later to come. So, uh, um, I know my uh, Baltimore Orioles always come around Mother's Day for some reason. That's always seems to be when they start appearing in the yard. So probably around that, like sort of mid-May mark would be my guess, but I, I don't actually know the answer to that question. Well, for sure. I'm just guessing. When we see them. <laughs> and Sarai has another question. Um, do we have any resources about where to act, find good native plants for our yards? Do you have any local suppliers or anywhere that you'd recommend sort of reaching out to or as a good starting point here in the Yeah. Region? Um, there is on the NPCA's website, and I think it is, um, Kelly, and if not, I can, I can resend it along in an email to you to share with others, but we do have a list of native plant suppliers. Um, I mentioned Sassafras Farms, that's here in Welland. Um, there's another one up more, um, Haldeman Way called Gaianase. There is, um, Little Otter Tree Farm. There's, um, I'm, you know, there's a whole list of them, but there's probably, 10 or 15 on our list anyways of different options. Um, Verbinnens is one that's up near sort of Hamilton Way, Dundas area. Um, those are the ones that are coming top of mind right now. For sure, we'll but make sure we share that link too. Yeah, yeah, there, it is, it's a list and it shows what types of plants they have. So whether you're looking for trees, shrubs, aquatic plants, wildflowers, it shows like which ones are available from different suppliers. Perfect. Um, and actually we got a good question about raking the leaves. So um, one person has raked all their leaves off the grass into the garden. And they're wondering if they can leave those leaves there or if they're gonna smother the native plants that they have planted. Um, I think native plants are really good at coming up through the leaf litter because that's what they have to do in the forest. Um, most of those, the photos that I shared from the, uh, in the first couple of slides there with the spring ephemerals, you often see them coming up even right through a leaf. As long as you didn't put like a, you know, a huge thick, thick, thick layer on there. If it's kind of similar to what you would find in a forest, then I, it should be fine. If they're really wet and like thick, then that might kind of tamp things down for a little while. But um, for the most part, I think if you just sort of raked your, your fall leaves into your garden, it should be fine. Excellent. Um, okay. And Nancy has a question with some scientific terms. So I'm going to apologize if sure. I pronounce it wrong. <laughs> uh, but she was reading this week that the soil in our backyard is not native anymore. It's less tannin microhiza and more worms and imported soil, it might be harder to plant native plants. Um, is this true or what's sort of your opinion on that? Ooh, that is a really good question. Um, I know that the um, Vineland Research Station is doing a lot of work. Actually, that's another really good resource I, did, I should have mentioned. Vineland Re um, Research Center has um, a plant selector tool where you can kind of put in the soil conditions and the type like where you're trying to plant plants and it'll spit out um, what are some good native plants. Um, they do a lot of research about soil and the importance of soil and I know that you know if, if we don't have soil that nothing's going to grow. As far as like you know every every yard and every lot and every property is different depending on the historical use of that site, right? If it's been a conservation area and it's been a protected landscape for, you know, hundreds of years, then you're going to have that nice organic soil and you're going to have good quality soil. If it's something that has been farmed or there's been development and then there's like, you know, soil that's been dug up and thrown on top. So you have like, you know, excavated clay on top. Um, so it just depends property to property. If you're, if you're curious, you can always kind of do a little, just dig a hole in your backyard and kind of look at the soil and see what's, what's in there. And there are certain organizations, I believe that you can even send soil samples off to, to kind of get a good idea of what's growing there. But I would say it just depends on your property and what the historical uses of the property are. So that's kind of a harder question to ask, but a good one, um, and, and soil's not my, my area of expertise, but the Vineland Research Center is excellent and has a lot of, of resources related to soil types and plant material and things like that. Excellent, thank you, uh, Carrie, for that. 
Um, I'm watching any more questions videos some nice accolades. Um, people coming in from places like Bruce County. So it's nice to have oh. a bit of a reach with Zoom. Nice. Um, but I'm not seeing any more. Uh... Actually, I do have one question. Um, given that we have a lot of clay in our soil, is it worth building a raised bed? Or is it better to go right into like earth? Or what sort of your take on that? That's one of those things that's sort of personal preference. And again, it depends on what's been happening on your property over the years. If you think that your soil has been heavily compacted, heavily disturbed, heavily, um, you know, sort of there's not much of an organic layer if you're just planting on top of um, like, you know, removing the sod and planting into it, it's sometimes helpful to add a little bit of compost or some organic material just to kind of give things that head start. And if you're not going to be able to, to water it all the time, a, a nice little layer of mulch is always helpful too, to kind of keep the moisture in and provide some of those nutrients. So again, it just depends on what your soil is like on your own property. If you think that you don't have much of an organic layer, it's not going to hurt to add a little bit of compost. Excellent. Uh, and then we'll just take one last question from Soraya. Um, she's wondering, other than monarchs and swallowtail butterflies, are there other common ones we can attract in this area? Um, other than that, there are lots of different types of, um, butterflies, um, painted ladies. Um, there's, uh, you mentioned the swallowtail butterfly, monarch butterfly. There's tons of different moss species. Um, there is, I believe one of the resources that Kelly can share is, um, a guide that shows host plants and the types of butterflies that they will attract. It's that it's one of those things that like, if you ask me in the middle of summer, and a whole bunch of butterflies, I'd be able to name off a whole bunch, but because it's spring and I haven't seen any in a while, the names are escaping me. Painted ladies. Um, I'm, they're escaping me right now. I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> there are actually a great segue. Um, cause we're actually going to be having another chat with Carrie next month, um, on the May 20th or May, not May 20th. May something. May 18th, I believe. Uh, it's the Wednesday of, of, in May, um, yep. on, uh, specifically on pollinators and what we can do to help our native pollinators. So that would be a good question to bring to that when we've had a little more time to dig into um, the butterflies and bees and bats and those uh, little guys who are so helpful to us. Um, yeah. So that will be, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. that will be coming up then. I will include that in my follow-up email as well. Um, and then we do have a chat on uh, in the first week in June about some of the hiking sites and uh, some of the hidden treasures on NPCA sites here in the region and best practices. So we've got those coming up with Carrie virtually, plus um, some community hikes. Uh, we'll be at St. John Conservation Area in Pelham on the 15th. Um, so that'll open for registration likely in the next day or two. Keep an eye on that. Um, we're also in the midst of making a new website for our new library. So bear with us for that. Um, and just also speaking to some of the things that Carrie said, um, this Saturday at the Rittenhouse Branch in Vineland, we're doing an Earth Day celebration, and we're going to have some of the free seed packets Carrie and the NPCA have generously provided for butterfly gardens available there, as well as um, greenhouse tours, wildflower seed bombs, um, information on uh, winning a free rain barrel. Uh, the town of Lincoln is doing a native tree giveaway, and that's available to Lincoln residents if you're um, here in town. So there's a lot of local things like that going on, especially around Earth Day, although, you know, it's important to take care of this uh, year round, but you know, we get a little more press. Um, yeah. <laughs> then. So I do encourage anyone who's at uh, Handy to Niagara to pop by the Rittenhouse branch, rain or shine between 11 and two. Um, it's right off Victoria in Vineland. Lots of free activities and information from the NPCA and lots of other great organizations here. Yep. Um, and, got her email popped up there. So if there are other questions, I'm sure she'll take those. Um, she's a great resource. Yeah. I just thought of something else, Kelly. Um, I'm just going to share this quickly if people want to jot this down. It's um, the Friends of Malcolmson Eco Park do an Earth Day um, planting, but they also do a Victoria Day native plant sale. So if anybody's thinking about just kind of going and poking around and seeing what types of plants they have for sale, I think you can kind of order them ahead of time and then pick them up on that. But that's a great way to kind of um, see what's available. So May 21st is uh, when they're doing their native plant sales. So that's another option as well for people looking for native plants. Absolutely. Yeah. And checking out again, your local garden centers, your local organizations like the Peninsula Field Naturals, the NPCA, there's um, a lot of really great things happening here in Niagara on conservation and, you know, being as eco-friendly as we can. Um, any and all feedback is always welcome. So if you've enjoyed tonight's presentation, uh, there's a topic you're interested in. Um, I work closely with great people like Carrie and other people here in, in the region, um, in this beautiful place we call home. So please share any uh, feedback you know, good, bad, ugly. Yeah, um, I can take like it. it here at all. We're, 
uh, just like the NPCA, we're here to serve our community and uh, we love to, you know, make sure we're giving information and resources that suit the needs of creating a really vibrant, wonderful place to call home. Uh, so watch for the follow-up email tomorrow. Um, for those who came in a little bit late, the full presentation will be up on um, the library YouTube channel in the next day or two with that follow-up email and any resources um, that Carrie provides, I'll be sure to link out um, as well as her contact information. Cause as I said, she's a, a great ally to have in the, in the natural world um, and lots of great accolades, Carrie. So thank you again for taking the time and to everyone for showing. Oh, thanks up. Kelly, always a pleasure to, to work with you. And thanks so much everyone for, for listening me, <laughs> listening to me drone on about something I'm really passionate about for so long and, and appreciate all the great questions. No, really engaging group. And uh, yeah, as I said, the chat's lighting up with great accolades. So thank you again, everyone. Oh, and I hope thanks, everyone. Join us for more information. And uh, hopefully we'll see you Saturday and, it's, and uh, out in nature too, not just on the screen. Take care. Have a wonderful evening.